Welcome to my Bible video series. Uh, we're in Jeremiah right now, and we're just going to share a few thoughts, beginning with Jeremiah chapter 25. And my first thought, it's another reason Jeremiah is down, it's downright confusing at times. Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 1, it says, The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jeroakim, <laughs> the son of Josiah. Okay. That was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. If you go back one chapter, chapter 24, it says this, After Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away uh, captive the king of Judah and the officials of Judah, so on, so on, so forth. So in chapter 24, verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar has now taken the king of Judah into captivity, Chapter 25, well, this is the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He hasn't even approached Jerusalem yet, so it's out of order. It makes it very confusing. Uh, but we know that Babylon did um, take over Jerusalem, and all the Jews were eventually transported to Babylon. And... Uh, but then, the Lord says, When 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation for their iniquity. And so, Babylon is an instrument that the Lord uses to discipline his people, Israel, Judah, the people of Jerusalem. Babylon is a tool used by the Lord to bring discipline to his people. But Babylon, you could say, went too far. They, they, they inflicted damage and harm, and God wasn't pleased, and he says, I'm going to judge Babylon. You may be in a unique position to have power over somebody else, and you could discipline them. You can, uh, maybe you're an employer and you could sack them, you know, cause them to lose their job. You might be a judge who could find somebody for breaking the law. But make sure you do it with the heart of the Lord. You discipline, but you don't destroy. Because if you're in a position of authority, you're now in a position of greater responsibility and greater accountability. So be aware of this. Babylon was judged. And Babylon was not the superpower that it was uh, previously, after all this was over. The Babylon never reached the heights of greatness again because of what they did to the Jewish people. Okay, now let's move over to chapter 26. And verse 3, again, they're back into the warning days. <laughs> this is before uh, Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem. And, and uh, again, I hear a lot of compassion here. Uh, thus says the Lord, you know, Jeremiah, you need to stand in the court of the Lord's house. That's in the temple court, you know, court area. Speak to the cities of Judah. All the people have come down to the temple to worship. And speak all the words I've commanded you to speak. Perhaps they will listen and everyone will turn from his evil way that I may repent of the calamity which I'm planning to do to them because of the evil of their deeds. God's telling Jeremiah, now this is, again, as far as chronological order goes, this is way in the early days of Jeremiah's ministry. There's still hope that if people return to the Lord, if they repent, if they humble themselves, God will spare the judgment. But, he, but the repentance is done by the Lord. We never think about the Lord needing to repent. We think of repentance as always turning from sin to righteousness. 
but repentance literally means change direction. The Lord is in a direction here that he's bringing judgment on his people because of their sin. And he has every intention of doing this, but he says over and over in scripture, if someone will intercede, if people will humble themselves and change their ways, if they'll come to me and ask for forgiveness and redemption, I am eager to change my way. I, the Lord says, I'm eager to repent. I'm not going to bring judgment. I'm going to bring healing. I'm going to bring reconciliation to my people. He says, perhaps they'll listen and I will repent from doing this damage, doing what I'm planning to do. But <laughs> we know what happens. Jeremiah's speaking out the words of judgment. You know, the Lord doesn't want to you know, destroy you, but come to him. But then the priests and the prophets in verse 7, and all the people heard the words of Jeremiah, and they go, why have you said such things? Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying this city will be desolate without an inhabitant and so forth? And down in verse 11, the priests and the prophets spoke to the officials and all the people saying a death sentence for this man, for he's prophesied against the city as you've heard in your hearing. Death to Jeremiah. What did you think Jeremiah did? Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Wait, I'll take it back. He didn't do any such thing. He moved on to say, this is the words of Jeremiah after they threatened him with death. The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city. Now amend your ways and your deeds and obey the voice of the Lord. And the Lord will change his mind about the misfortune which he's pronounced against you. But as for me, I'm in your hands. Know for certain, if you put me to death, you'll bring innocent blood on yourselves. He didn't back up. Too many Christians will back up and say, well, I better not, I got to be careful what I say, because it might offend somebody. Well, I might not get that position in the church. I'd really like to be on the board, but if I say this right now, then they won't let me be on the board. But here Jeremiah was faced with the loss of his life. And he said, you can do with me whatever you want to. I'm telling you what God said. Between you and him. Between you and him. But, we, well, just to let, fill out the story, the officials and the people demand, de defend Jeremiah. See, God's always had a people. So often the devil will get us to believe, I am the only one. I'm the only Christian in this whole city. Everybody in the churches, they're just living to please themselves. They're the people that aren't in the church, and they're not going to church, and they're obviously just pagan, and they don't care anything about Jesus. But God's always had a people. He said that to Elijah. Elijah was feeling sorry for himself. <laughs> and the Lord says, no, you don't understand. I got all kinds of people who never bowed their knee to Baal. God always has a people, and, and we, we need to pray for God's people to come together, for God's people to have the courage to speak out against the evil of our day, to come together to lift up the name of Jesus and show the hope that's within us because Jesus lives in our heart. But the, because the crowd, though, came and defended Jeremiah, his life was spared. Now, I'm gonna, this video is not going to be very long today. Um, but I found an interesting little word in chapter 27. Now, we remember a couple of chapters ago, God says, I'm going to judge Babylon. I'm going to punish Babylon because of how they treated the Jewish people. But if you look at chapter 27 and verse 6, uh, he says, well, I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. Nebuchadnezzar is called a servant of God. A servant of God. Now, um, Dean Sherman, who's a really neat guy, and he's a, one of the leaders of Youth with a Mission, a great teacher, very good teacher. I heard him speak one time about, I guess it was something in the book of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. He said, Nebuchadnezzar may have made it, <laughs> meaning heaven. He may have actually had a faith in the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, 
that would allow him to enjoy salvation. He wasn't perfect. He was a tyrant of a king. But he did have faith. And the Lord did a lot of things. We'll get to this in Daniel. But he did a lot of things to get Nebuchadnezzar's attention. And Nebuchadnezzar said, you know, told Daniel, and really told Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, your God is the one living God. And he told the people, you, we need to serve this God. <laughs> but here, Nebuchadnezzar's a servant of the Lord. And sometimes we forget we wrestle against, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. So Nebuchadnezzar was never really the enemy of Israel. It's just the devil took advantage of the situation to bring more harm on the people of the Lord. Than, and he influenced Nebuchadnezzar and the other guys that were in a position of authority over Israel to, to bring more harm to them than what God ever intended. So remember that... Uh, just I thought it was unusual. Nebuchadnezzar is called a servant of the Lord. In other words, the, the, the authority Nebuchadnezzar had was, was in the hands of the Lord to direct. And so he could never really do more than what God would allow him to do. Now, Father, we just want you to call us your servant. We want to serve you with our whole heart to love you and honor you and lift up your name and shine the light of your love into the darkness of the world that's around you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.